is working on a plan B. Good morning and welcome to the January 25th meeting of the Civil Rights Utilities Economic Development and Arts Committee. I'm Lisa Herpel, the chair of the committee and council member representing West Seattle and South Park District 1. It is 10.06 a.m. I'm joined by my colleagues, council member Sawant and council member O'Brien, and we'll call this meeting to order. Uh, what we have before us today is we're going to start off with uh, a cultural spotlight. Uh, led by the Office of Arts and Culture. We will follow that with um, public comment. And then we have three items of business. The first, uh, discussion and uh, possible vote on a resolution uh, related to eviction reform efforts. The second, um, a public hearing and discussion related to the city of Seattle's datum point. We'll learn more about that later. And then uh, lastly, um, a briefing from Seattle Public Utilities um, on their seismic uh, resiliency program. Uh, so with that, we'll pass it off to our cultural spotlight. Jenny. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jenny Koo, and this is Maya McKnight. We're here from the Office of Arts and Culture. We are working with the Office of the Waterfront to do a one-day activation of the viaduct before it is demolished. So we will be doing an art festival that is featuring over 100 artists, and we're going to tell you a little bit about them. Great. Um, so the Viaduct event will happen on February 2nd from 12.30 until about 6 o'clock at night. Um, we'll be activating from a, approximately Seneca to Western with a whole variety of different artist installations, activities, including a wide variety of um, things to be seen, enjoyed, um, and really add to the experience. Some examples include um, some sculptures that will be um, inviting people to walk around and sit upon with the appreciation of the view. Um, some vintage Shasta trailers in which be, are the same vintage of the viaduct itself, um, as well as 3D murals to be really able to kind of see what the waterfront will become. And the day will start with a procession that will be the end, one of the main entry points is Seneca. So we'll have Fremont, uh, Fremont Art Council and their artists will have um, Leela Vision with a lot of uh, arts and cultural groups like Leela Kathak. Um, we'll have uh, musical performances from uh, the Fabulous Downey Brothers, cur curated storytelling and, um, and uh, comedy and variety show type of fair as well. Um, and we also have um, Roger Fernandez and some uh, native indigenous family canoes and storytelling from those groups. And who else do we have? Yeah. <laughs> Um, one, of, one of the items that we have been working on as we're planning this event is really <laughs> creating an a atmosphere of reflection as well as appreciation, a, really an opportunity to say goodbye to the viaduct as well as imagine what will become of this new location. And so the artists are, have been working hard, really thinking about how they want to make, make their mark and share with the public thoughts feelings and impressions of this momentous event. And this is some work from April Soderman that will be featured on the viaduct as well. And so there's sp site-specific installations, and it'll just be an opportunity for a kind of a group processing of emotion. There's a lot of emotion about what's happening. And um, so we hope to see folks on Feb Saturday, February 2nd. Um, folks are encouraged to go to 99step4.com, which is the state's website to book their time to ticket. Um, and if they aren't, if folks aren't able to get the time that they want, they're encouraged to still come. And if there's capacity, we'll, we're going to try and accommodate everyone that we can. So there is still time available uh, through the booking process. I had heard that there wasn't, so that's good um, So there's a couple different, uh, so there's like tunnel and viaduct tickets. And last we checked, there were still tickets for viaduct only. And this art activation is specific to the top deck of the viaduct. So dress warmly. Be prepared for possibility of rain. Um, and it's this great opportunity to, one, say goodbye to the viaduct and hello to what will become the new waterfront. And um, I think you already mentioned it, but I'm just going to un uh, underscore. It is a free to the public event, but um, yes. you encourage tickets or require tickets just because of the large interest in the event. Yes, it is free and open to the public. And then the time ticket is to handle, just to make sure we handle capacity and keep it safe. Yeah. Right, and the main, the main entry points will be both at Seneca and at the North, North Hub near the Seattle Center. And the date again? February 2nd. Saturday, February 2nd. Fantastic. 
All right. Sounds uh, super fun and uh, thoughtful as well. Uh, really appreciate the um, the lens of uh, change, and uh, but also recognizing that there is um, some processing to do um, with that. I um, was I decided to take one, my last ride on the viaduct. Um, the evening it closed at about 9:30, and uh, watches watched people processing in a uh, their own way, um, and um, it was it was quite the party up there. So it's great yeah. that we're having another one. So thank you. Thank you so much. All right, next we're gonna move into public comment. We have seven people signed up to speak. And we will be keeping time. Uh, two minutes a person, and you can uh, watch on the clock and see when your time is going. And he'll also um, be holding a sign to indicate as well when uh, you have a minute and 30 seconds and when your time is up. So I'm going to read two names into the record. Uh, and if folks can uh, approach the two mics, that would be great. We have Alex Zimmerman followed by Melody Clark. <laughs> Dear Kyle, my lovely Führer, a Nazi garbage rats, a dirty anti-Semite, and critida. My name is Alex Zimmerman. I want to speak about eviction. Uh, I have a six eviction. Six, not too much for 30 years. In 96, I bring class action on behalf of 500 families who want to be evicted in Bellevue in Central Park East apartment. And I win this class action on behalf of 500 families. Five years ago, I evict the two Sheriff Gestapo, when my case in appeal, is fascism go out of control right now. So how we can fix this problem in stopping eviction? It's very simple, and I talk about this in the chamber a thousand times. We need to stop in Amazon. No one counsel for five years use very simple expression, stop Amazon. When we stop in Amazon, price stabilize, and not will be eviction. What is you doing now is a masturbation. It's don't fix it problem. It's only one problem what is can be fixed with one action, stopping Amazon. Ever right now, Amazon won't hire another 10,000 people. Stopping this, moratorium, 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 you freaking cretina. It's exactly who you are. It's very simple. Stop Amazon and everything will be back. Seattle will be back again. Maybe not like 10 or 20 years ago, because I live almost more than 30 years, but will be stabilized. Simple. No one from you, nine crook in this chamber, talking about Amazon, stopping Amazon. No one for five years. Right now, speak to everybody who listen to me. Stand up, America. Clean this dirty chamber from this cretina with Nazi Gestapo principle. Thank you very much. Melody Clark will be followed by Tiffany McCoy. <laughs> Hello, my name is Melody Clark. I'm a real change vendor. I um, incurred an eviction um, several years ago because of um, some monetary uh, 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 causes that were not under my control. And I paid my eviction off, and then it st ha still haunts me. It's on my record for the rest of my life. I paid it off. I have to have a letter from my landlord and the credit company saying that it's paid. And though I paid it off, I got called saying that you have to go to court. You owe us money. And so, no, I didn't. I paid it off. They said, no, you have to go to court. I said, I have these letters saying I paid. Fax it to us. And so even though I paid it off, I'm always under this thing saying, you, some other company can call me and say, you owe us money, even though I paid them off. Mm -hmm. And it's on my record for the rest of my life. Even though I made, the mistake was made, I paid it. Mm -hmm. I paid my dues. And 
it should fall off some time instead of following the rest of my life. Thank you. Thank you. Following Tiffany McCoy is Heather Pierce. Good morning, my name is Tiffany McCoy. I'm the lead organizer for Real Change. Um, we did have other vendors that wanted to come, but um, even though Melody did do the one night count um, and is still here this morning and we appreciate that other vendors were around the county doing the count. So um, they'll come next time because hopefully this resolution is going to be rolling into an actual ordinance um, because we have this groundbreaking study that shows very clearly um, the pipeline from eviction to homelessness. And we know that we're in the midst of a crisis and we need to be tackling it from, from all angles. And we do have different vendors at Real Change that have been evicted. It's following them around for their entire life. Um, Melody was telling me earlier that the company that um, she had to pay but back to because it went to arrears um, is now out of business. So if ever those documents were lost, trying to obtain that proof that that was paid is going to be significantly difficult because the company doesn't exist anymore. Um, and so I just really hope that um, the next step is turning this into an ordinance and we don't need another study. The Women's Commission study was quite strong, quite holistic, uh, quite groundbreaking. And um, I just ask that you all um, hold your resolve against um, the landlord lobby because we know that they'll be turning out and giving doomsday scenarios about how they're all gonna go out of business. But we see from other, other states and other counties around the nation that there are still landlords, but there are still significant protections for tenants. So please stay resilient um, against that. Thank you. Thank you. Heather Pierce will be followed by Sochi Makovic. Good morning, council members. I'm Heather Pierce from the Rental Housing Association of Washington. I am concerned that this resolution will do little to solve homelessness prevention, and moreover, it can exacerbate Seattle's dwindling affordable housing stock. 74% of the cases in the losing home report fell behind due to a financial emergency. Yet council would rather create policies that force rental owners paying mortgages on their rental properties to wait on rent payment for their tenants, potentially causing the owners to default on their mortgage. Keep in mind many rent payments, uh, excuse me, keep in mind rental, many rental owners have a landlord too called the bank, which could result in the loss of the rental property altogether, leaving the rental owner in a financial hardship and the renter out of a home. Seattle has a housing trust fund, which the, rental housing, um, which the Rental Housing Association supported. And by this city's own March 2018 evaluation, short-term rental subsidies for renters experiencing financial emergency were 97% effective in keeping renters housed, circumventing the eviction process altogether. Yet council did not elect to increase short-term rental assistance in the next biennium. Many of our members, the small business rental owners are paying mortgages. And this is a type of owner Seattle should try to preserve in the market. A recent UW study commissioned by the council reflected that small market owners offer more flexible terms, lower rent and longer tenancies, creating policies that puts affordable housing at risk because the loan defaults when you can circumvent the eviction process altogether is a missed opportunity to create policy that prevents eviction without undue burden. With more than 150,000 rental units operating in the city of Seattle and 1,200 evictions in 2017, it's clear that rental owners and managers are in the business of housing people, not evicting them. Following Sochi is Gina Owens. Okay, just, just a couple quick facts. So first of all, most mortgages, uh, you're not late on rent or late on the mortgage until the 16th of the month. Uh, tenants have three days. Uh, also, the landlord is not obligated to accept rent after the three day notice. And so, you know, <laughs> that doesn't really, you can have all the short term rental assistance in the world, but if you don't, if the landlord refuses it, it doesn't help you much. Second of all, uh, places such as Tennessee have 14 days to pay rent, and let's see what is the average rent there. The average rent for this state is $857. Wow, it's really gonna, giving people a little bit more time to help, is really gonna hurt our housing market? Don't think so. Also, Ohio, which has discretion, their average rent is $843. South Carolina, another one that has discretion where I saw a judge give a tenant a month to go find an attorney when I, I was there over the holidays. Average rent, $923.
let's talk about how many people are homeless in these places. Uh, Tennessee, 12.5 people are homeless per 10,000 people. Ohio, 8.7 people are homeless per 10,000. South Carolina, 7.9 per 10,000. <laughs> what is Washington? This is not even Seattle. This is just Washington numbers, and it's way higher in Seattle. Four, $1,442. People who are homeless, 29 people per 10,000. So the idea that, that in strengthening tenant protections is going to make our housing crisis worse is absolutely ridiculous and not based on any fact. It's based in fear-mongering. And also, if you're a business owner, you keep on talking about you're being a business owner. If you're a business owner who buys a mortgage that you can't afford, you're dumb. Like, I'm just saying that straight up. And most mortgages, most landlords who rent out a property they own, they, they bought the mortgage decades ago when rent was way higher, so they're making a ridiculous amount of money. And when you consider the amount of times that they actually interact with those renters, I've lived here for seven years. I've talked to a landlord twice, so how much money are they yeah. making per hour? I'm just saying. Sorry. Go on. <laughs> That's it. Uh, Gina Owens will be followed by Kalani Luxmore. Gina, you going to speak? You don't have to. <laughs> Maybe speak about your problem. I'm so used to speaking, I just automatically put her in Sorry, when my boss speaks, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, city council members. Um, I think what I want to do right now is just to say I really love the three of you up there, and I love that you are so people-oriented that you really want to hear from the people and do what's right. So I appreciate that, and I really support that um, you want to push something through in the way of um, eviction reform, because it's necessary. And um, one of the reasons why I think it's necessary is because people like me who have a past history of paying rent on time every month until we were in a car accident. That car accident didn't hold any weight when it came to my eviction in court where it should have. It should have been a case where um, the judges are able to have discretionary decision making. And they didn't have that at that time. So the only thing was um, the judge had to go with the landlord. And that's really a sad thing because a lot of times in these evictions, it's because of a circumstance that people are there. They don't just not pay their rent for a month or two. They're there because landlords don't want them in their building anymore. And that's sad. So I hope what I said today resonates. Thank you. Kalani Luxmore will be followed by Tanya Yasu. Hi. Does this thing work? Okay. Hi, my name is Kalani, and um, um, recently I was in the Times for an eviction for $2. Um, it was kind of crazy. I'm a single mom of three children, and um, it was for one missed rent payment, and let's not get into the details there, but there was no protection for me or my family. Luckily, the hearing went well and we settled um, on the conditions and terms of Ballard Realty, which I, I, I mean, I just have to pay my rent on time and give them my utilities that I was withholding because I did not think that it was fair. Two dollars and me and my three young children, three years and younger, my youngest is seven months and my oldest is three. Um, I just couldn't even believe it. And I just, I think that there's laws in place that allow rental companies to do this sort of thing. And I'll never get back my sanity points, you know, for freaking out over a $2 eviction. Um, yeah, I, um, I don't know what else really to say, except for there needs to be some sort of reform and there needs to be protection for people who are in my situation. And um, I feel like it was purely discrimination and, and they were just picking the first person that they could get out of the building. I'm the only voucher holder in my building. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, for $2, the judge was not very impressed with it and neither was I. I mean, I have a job to get to, I have three kids and we're on foot and 
I, I had to agree to drop off my rent all the way in downtown Seattle when I live in Lake City just to make sure that they get their $2 payment. And it's absolutely ridiculous that I had to agree to those terms um, in order to stay in my unit until my lease was over. Even though I've never had a history of paying late, I've never, I mean, it's $2, guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't know. I just hope that my story can sit with you guys and you can know that there are people out there that do need more protection and more rights. Thank you for sharing your story. Okay. Tanya. Greetings and good day, one and all. I'm Tana Yasu, a commissioner on the Seattle Women's Commission, appointed by Lisa Herbold. <laughs> so um, I'm also on the Violence Prevention and Justice Subcommittee there. I just want to say, I need to say quickly, I approve and endorse the eviction reform resolution. I would like to thank the council members Herbold, O'Brien, and others uh, for immediately getting the ball rolling on behalf of Seattle's most vulnerable citizens. I thank Council Member Herbold for sharing information about Seattle Martin Luther King Jr. Organization's Opportunity Fair this past Monday in our newsletter. Um, that's important, you know, people need these great jobs and there were lots of companies there offering positions there. Um, I'm happy to be on the on the co organizing coalition as well. So it was really great to put that event, help put that event together. But um, this past Monday, the city and greater area celebrated the birthday of murdered civil rights leader, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We can boast about being the only city in the country to have a county named after Dr. King. And as I stated, I'm on the violence prevention and Justice Subcommittee of the Seattle Women's Commission. And I declare evictions to be violent and a violation of citizens of Seattle civil rights. Wrongful evictions are an abortion of justice. January is also Human Trafficking and Slavery Awareness and Prevention Month as well. I didn't see it pointed out in the resolution, but unfortunately there are some property managers that take advantage of not being able to, for people to not be able to pay rent in cash and they solicit sexual and labor from them. So let's add that to the, to the conversation. Thank, thank you, Commissioner you. Yasu, and thank you for all of your leadership on these issues and others. Um, I believe that's all we have, I have on these pages signed up, but I think um, I saw somebody else sign up. There's. Thank you. You can state your name for the record. Appreciate it. Noel. Good morning. My name is Skyly Salstrom. I'm a Seattle resident since I was two, and I'm also an attorney, and I have volunteered a lot with the Housing Justice Project down in, in Kent. I have, <laughs> I have seen something that I appreciate being in the resolution. Um, is the recognition of the attorney's fees provision that is included in the Landlord-Tenant Act that allows for the prevailing party to, re to receive their attorney's fees. As someone who has volunteered, I've seen countless times, I can't even begin to describe the number of times where I've seen the amount of attorney's fees dwarf the amount that was actually owed in late fees, or not even late fees or in past rent. My concern, however, with the resolution is that I feel like that is something that is legislative in nature yeah, that needs to be taken up with the Landlord-Tenant Act. It needs to be resolved in that method. And I'm just wondering what is being done about resolving that at the statewide or le legislative le level. But I appreciate, though, that Seattle is taking an effort in addressing this issue. And hopefully, it can send a message so that there can be um, some changes that are done uh, statewide. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, I'll close public comment and we can move into item one on the agenda.
Uh, Jen, item one is resolution 31861, a resolution recognizing the harms that evictions from housing have on tenants and marginalized communities and describing the city council's plan to help avoid and mitigate those harms. Thank you, Noel. Introductions, please. Asha Venkatraman, Council Central Staff. Thank you. Um, and just to set the stage uh, back um, in December, we heard um, the Seattle Women's Commission's uh, report and recommendations. Um, earlier this month, we uh, reviewed a draft, uh, draft resolution. Since that time, um, this resolution has been um, uh, has been introduced um, on the referral calendar and referred to committee. We're going to um, have another discussion um, about the resolution, um, and I intend uh, to vote on it if there are no substantive changes that we um, make today. I do want to um, comment on a couple of the things that we heard in public comment. Um, one, um, the uh, representative from uh, the Rental Housing Association um, we had concerns um, that we weren't doing enough to um, add funding for eviction prevention services um, and suggested that we hadn't done so um, in the last uh, budget discussions. And um, in fact, we added uh, nearly $600,000 over the biennium in the last budget discussion. I'm not suggesting it's enough, um, but we are very aware of how much um, eviction prevention funds can um, can help avoid evictions and are a necessary component of eviction reform. Um, also, I've heard um, a couple folks speak today um, about uh, what the intent of this resolution is. I want to clarify um, that the intent of the resolution is to identify the, um, the problems and as a council embrace the problems as, as identified uh, by the Seattle Women's Commissions as problems that we need to solve um, and make sure that the entire council and the community are united in that effort to solve those issues. Um, and we do intend to follow this resolution with an ordinance. Um, to the uh, last young woman who spoke, there are several unique landlord-tenant laws in addition to um, the State Landlord-Tenant Act, and we do have the authority here in Seattle to work on some of these issues. Um, there is a parallel effort going on in the State Legislature as well to do um, a really important eviction reform. So with that, I'll pass it off to Asha. Um, so this is resolution 31861, um, it is substantially the same as the draft we discussed um, in our last committee meeting. Um, I just note that there's an addition of two uh, whereas clauses, um, you'll see on page one, it's clauses, the fourth and the fifth one, that highlight the impacts of eviction on the LGBTQ community and on seniors. Um, otherwise, it is substantially the same um, as the draft we discussed in committee uh, on January 8th. And so I'll just do a quick summary of what is in the recitals and then what is in the, um, the um, rest of the, the legislation. Um, bless you. So the recitals go through and um, talk about the causes and impacts, uh, some key findings from Losing Home, the Seattle Women's Commission report. Um, and then it continues to memorialize the actions that um, the council took during the budget process, both the statements of legislative intent that it asked um, departments to respond to, as well as funding that was provided in things like um, uh, eviction prevention, um, uh, resources to uh, legal organizations to provide assistance to tenants, um, and then some of the language that we included in the 2019 city's uh, legislative agenda around um, the, the just cause eviction ordinance, um, as well as increasing the time period to cure non-payment of rent. Um, and lastly, giving the courts the ability to stay um, rid of restitution for good cause um, to use their discretion to do so. And so the, um, the rest of the legislation is split into two major parts. Um, it outlines some of the problems that council will be addressing um, in this next year, and then a couple things that we'll be looking at um, in the longer term. So the problems identified that we'll be looking at this year um, include um, the next seven things, which are looking at financial hardships for tenants that are experiencing domestic violence um, in that they're often held liable for damages caused by a perpetrator of domestic violence. <laughs> Uh, looking at the lack of flexibility in avoiding an eviction when emergencies happen, so temporary unemployment, medical emergencies, death in the family, um, that sort of thing. 
uh, looking at the lack of awareness and understanding around the eviction process itself, the effect of things like mutual termination agreements, um, some lack of awareness around what actual uh, rights are for tenants, as well as free legal resources that are available to tenants. Um, looking at non-rent charges, so things like late fees, court costs, attorney's fees, things that add an additional burden to tenants um, who are already maybe facing difficulties just paying the, the rent charges. Um, the next one is looking at um, lease provisions that prohibit uh, a tenant to have a roommate or ones that give landlords the discretion to be able to refuse a request for a roommate, even an unreasonable um, rejection of that request or uh, the ability of landlords to add extra fees or strict screening criteria for a potential roommate. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, the lease termination fees. So if you have to end your lease before the end of the term, um, those fees can often be high and they can also accumulate even though it's relatively easy in this market for a landlord to re-rent a unit um, and the, the requirements they have to make a reasonable effort to do so. Um, and lastly, looking at um, what I mentioned previously about the uh, court's ability to have the discretion to stay in action um, if the tenant has good cause for not being able to pay their rent. Um, over the longer term, so this, those items um, we'll be looking at in the next year. And then over the longer term, um, council will also be looking at um, how to address issues like tenants who are in need of additional support during the eviction process because of physical or mental health disorders or um, they're hospitalized. Looking at tenants who, um, who live in a unit when the tenant of record, so the, the person that's on the lease um, passes away, um, those tenants don't have a right to remain in the unit. So looking at how to ameliorate some of those impacts and then looking at how um, to decrease the impact of having landlord tenant debt um, in a credit report, which can um, often make it difficult to find housing. Thank you. Um, and so I, how I see um, the council would be proceeding, um, assuming passage at full council a week from this Monday, um, is that for items A through G, um, we would develop some um, options and alternatives uh, for ways to address these issues and um, we would um, hopefully um, use this committee as um, the place where we can do deliberation around uh, which options we want to pursue um, and fold into um, an ordinance uh, addressing those items. Um, I also just wanted to uh, underscore uh, or flag um, my interest in um, addressing the issue that Commissioner Yasu identified. Um, I would presume that a landlord extorting um, sex for rent is already illegal um, and um, would be covered <coughs> under the prohibited acts locally, um, including harassment, but I, I, it's, I think it's something that we should maybe take another look at to see um, whether or not sort of the general prohibition against um, against harassment against tenants um, is sufficient to address this issue as well. Colleagues, any questions, thoughts? Um, I, uh, Councilmember Herbold, thanks for your leadership on this resolution. I um, want to thank all the folks in the audience today and at previous meetings and frankly for all the work that the Women's Commission and others did to bring this information forward. Um, it's uh, astonishing um, how significant this crisis around eviction is and that the results have direct impacts on folks on the crisis around homelessness. Um, it's really also, you know, horrific to hear about stories like the, um, like the, what we heard today and last week and that the Times ran a good story on about how $2 can be the case, cause for eviction. Um, it's, it's apparent to me that there are things that we can collectively do as a community to significantly reduce or even completely eliminate evictions. And obviously the city has a role to play in that um, to figure out how we can uh, deliver some of the resources necessary to help out folks that are um, struggling. But, but the current structure really makes it nearly impossible for that to happen. And we're gonna need some flexibility to make that happen. And so I think this is, um, you know, I recognize that this is a resolution. It's a great first step. Um, uh, it alone doesn't change anything, but I think it makes it lays out a clear path for how we can move swiftly to address this. 
and it's great to hear that there are other there are um, attempts to make some changes elsewhere, um, including at the state level, which would be great to see. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Herbold. Uh, yeah, I agree. The resolution is an important step forward. I want to thank everybody who uh, testified today. I know you have, as Kelani said, you have jobs to go to as well, and. Um, and also for fighting this fight. It's not easy to do that when you have everything else pressing on you, including uh, childcare and everything. Uh, and I also wanted to specifically also call out Melody for coming here after doing the one night count. <laughs> it's really, really important that you came here. Um, and yeah, and, and, and I agree, we should be uh, following up with the ordinance as you uh, laid out. Uh, I also wanted to also just highlight the numbers. I mean, we're, uh, the study from the Housing Justice Project showed uh, what horrendous numbers we have in terms of evictions. You know, it talks about every district, District 1, District 2, District 3 are, of course, the most vulnerable. And I just wanted to give a sense, I mean, if, when you um, do the math of how much there was, and for example, in District 3, in the whole year of 2017, there were more than 250 evictions that happened. And these are, these are numbers from the court cases. I mean, there, we know that there are a lot, a lot more renters who get evicted who don't go to court. So uh, I think it's safe to say that it is much greater than 250, perhaps adding up to one eviction a day. So this is really an epidemic that needs to be addressed in each of our districts. So uh, this is an important step forward, and I, I really agree with uh, Tiffany and others who said that this is pure fear-mongering. I thought Sochi had some powerful statistics to show <laughs> that this is all, totally fear-mongering. And you know, we, this is not new to us. The landlord lobby, the restaurant lobby, the rest hotel lobby, they, uh, this is what they do. They, they fear-monger, and everything that they say crumbles in the face of over overwhelming data. So it's important that we all empower ourselves with those data and you know, just as Sochi was doing, you know, reel off those numbers and empower renters to fight this and not accept these lies that somehow strengthening the power of renters is going to uh, lead to some sort of demise for the rental market itself, which we know is not going to happen. Um, just following up on that a little bit uh, around what the actual impacts um, are likely to be in Seattle for the rental housing market as compared to other uh, locales. Um, Edmund Witter, uh, an attorney with the Housing Justice Project, uh, made note that if um, who, he had practiced law in New York City previously, and he made note um, that the practices that he sees happen in uh, Washington State, if they were occurring in uh, New York City, they would be determined legally to be considered harassment. Um, and that includes the frequent and um, and pervasive practice of uh, evictions for non-payment of rent for um, a month of rent or less, um, of which um, in this study, 87% of the evictions were for non-payment of rent and over half were for non-payment of rent for a month or less. And so again, um, in other places, evictions for that cause would be considered harassment. So, um, you know, just looking back on how the Just Cause Eviction Ordinance was first passed uh, in 1980, thanks to the advocacy and organizing of community groups and uh, tenants working together. Um, the frame that was used then in 1980 for passage of the Just Cause Eviction Ordinance, um, a regulation giving uh, tenants um, uh, more rights to um, oppose no cause evictions, something that we have exclusively in this state um, only here in Seattle, uh, that the frame that was used for that was um, homelessness prevention. That's, that's why um, that law was able to be passed in 1980, um, because of the upsurge in homelessness that they were seeing there. Um, and it is true that we need to address homelessness uh, a lot of different ways. We need to continue to fund eviction prevention funds, and uh, we need to build more affordable housing. But an important component is today, and it always has been, is addressing the rights of tenants. And so I'm really proud to be able to work with the two of you um, and community members to um, address this issue that's been near and dear to my heart for a long time. 
So if um, there are no further questions, I'll call a vote. All right. Um, all those in favor of voting for resolution 31861, vote aye. 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 None opposed, none abstaining, and the resolution passes, and it will move on to full council Monday after next. Thanks again. Agenda item two is Council Bill 119420, an ordinance relating to the city of Seattle's datum point, updating the vertical and horizontal reference datum for City of Seattle departments and outside entities as a standard elevation reference plane, requiring certain measurements for preliminary plats to be based on the updated vertical and horizontal datum, amending chapter 1.20 of the Seattle Municipal Code, and, and amending sections 23.22020, 23.75100, and 25060090 of the Seattle Municipal Code. Great, can we start with introductions please? Brian Goodnight, Council Central Staff. Yep. I'm Tanya Treat, Engineering Technical Services Division Director, Project Delivery Branch of Seattle Public Utilities. Thank you. And I'm Chris Royak, I'm the manager for the Land Survey and Technical Resources Group in, in Engineering and Technical Resources Branch for Seattle Public Utilities. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so we're gonna have a briefing, we're gonna open up for a public hearing. We are not gonna vote on this today. We'll bring it back at our next committee meeting. Um, and let's learn all about what a datum point is. <laughs> Brian, want to kick it off? Uh, sure, I'll just uh, briefly state that, uh, so the bill does relate to the city's uh, vertical and horizontal datum points, which SPU staff will explain in more detail in a moment. Um, uh, but before they do that, I just want to say that, uh, as you mentioned, it does amend the land use code, so there, a public hearing is required, and notice for that was um, done on December 17th. And then second, you'll see that there, the original bill is transmitted and introduced, uh, contains some errors in it, and so therefore there's a proposed substitute in your packets. Um, you don't have to move on that today, but uh, it just makes technical corrections, and it's indicated as version D2. So okay, that's just, great, thank thanks. you. Okay, great. Right. So just very briefly, a little bit of history uh, about uh, kind of the organizational structure of the city department. So back in 21 years ago, 1997, Seattle Public Utilities was created. It was created by a combination of the Seattle Water Department and the sewer and drainage components of the Seattle Engineering Department. At the same time, the Seattle, the, the Seattle Department of Transportation was created and that contained the Transportation Department. So at the time, um, it was decided that the land survey function would stay within Seattle Public Utilities. And so as a result, we provide most of the land surveying activities for the majority of the project, of the departments of the City of Seattle. Um, the land survey group in SPU is the largest group across the city. Um, and we have the most licensed professional surveyors, and we provide the following services. Uh, first of all, we provide land survey and base mapping services to support projects for the major capital departments, primarily Seattle City Light, SPU, and uh, Seattle Department of Transportation. Can I we, pause we, for a second, quick sure. second? Um, I believe there's a presentation, and um, it's not... Uh, synced up with this is just an introduction. Okay, I'm sorry. got it. I've and just, and, and then we'll get into the meat and potatoes. All right, I saw uh, background, just, but this okay. Is, yeah, this is background. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for pointing that out. Um, we also establish and maintain right-of-way monuments as required by state law, and we develop and maintain the standards, the city standards for survey and base map, and that applies to all surveyors that are working in the right-of-way of our city. Uh, so it's in this role as a city standards maintenance that we are coming to you today to discuss the change in ordinance. All right. And with that, Chris will right. present. Fantastic. Thank so you. Now we'll get into the presentation. <laughs> um, so to answer the question, first of all, uh, a data point is the initial reference point for uh, all construction. So everything is is based off a common point, and that way, it, as as the city gets developed, it has some commonality between projects to projects. So there, there's no questions and the image illustrates why it's important to have a common data point. Is that literally something that happened um, when there it, wasn't one or is it just uh, symbolic? Okay. <laughs> Fortunately. Uh, but if I, if I may, a little background about uh, the data point. Shortly after the city became a city, uh, they determined that it was necessary to have a datum point, and this point was established in 1877. It was set at uh, the top of the step of the Dexter Horton Bank. Uh, 
they collected information uh, on a, a marker that was set on a pier, and they observed the uh, average high tides for uh, seven no, for seven weeks, and based on that is what they set the datum point. As they got more information, better information, in 1883, they decided that uh, they better uh, amend it because it was uh, things weren't flowing properly. So in, in 1883, they they uh, adjusted the datum point. Then in 1889, they had the Great Fire, and they said that, that point was wiped out, so they needed to establish a new point. This point was then established at the Pioneer Building, um, and it was set at, at ordinance, in the ordinance in 1891, and this became the official city of Seattle datum. That point is still in existence. I took that photo uh, just a month ago. So that point is still there. Fast forward to 2003, the city decided to adopt the national standard for datums. And those points uh, were established by the National Geodetic Survey. The datums were uh, the North American vertical datum of, of 1988 and the North American datum uh, for uh, horizontal in, in 1983. And it was the 1981 adjustment that is was set in the uh, ordinance in 2003. Well, over time and as better information came, there have been few, uh, subsequent adjustments to the datum. The current datum now is uh, uh, it's 2011, and in 2022, the National Geodetic Survey will again create a new adjustment, and so at that point, everything will shift again. So up to 2003, um, well, I should say up to um, 1891, um, the datum was established, the city did it. Correct. And then after that, um, in two, starting in 2003, we adopted um, an established datum by uh, the National uh, Geodetic Survey, is that correct? Correct. Um, and so how, did, how, is there a difference in how um, we versus they um, established the datums? Uh, the cities was based upon, again, like I said, they measured the high tide they, uh, um, at, uh, and arbitrarily set a point. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the National Geodetic Survey has, has done an extensive uh, network adjustment across the entire United States, and this is the same datum that the state has adopted, and the, the King County, most every county in the state of Washington has adopted these datums as well. Uh, this is a uh, picture from our uh, standards and specifications. You can uh, zoom in here. Those are the different datums that uh, have been across the, uh, the city. We've used uh, mean lower low water, the Corps of Engineers datum, the obsolete city of Seattle datum, the King County Metro datum, NGVD 29, and then uh, NAVD 88. And if you look at uh, this chart across the, on the other side, those are the actual zero points. And you can see they don't all line up. Zero is not the same zero from one datum to the other. So we have to keep, uh, as, as the city has changed uh, and adopted different datums, we, have to, we, we will, again, have to update this chart to reference the new datum that's in, in 2022. But we will not need to um, update the legislation in 2022. No, that's okay. the purpose of the way that uh, this legislation is written, is that uh, in 2003 it was locked into 8391. Uh, and like I said, it's been changed numerous times since then. And the way it is written now, it's following the state. The state is doing the same thing. They're, they're amending the, the, the RCWs and the, uh, revised, the revised Code of Washington and the Washington Administrative Codes to uh, reflect the changes that are coming. And then they won't have, they won't have to rewrite their uh, laws as well. So we're, we're, gonna, we're writing the, this ordinance or the amendment to the ordinance that it uh, will follow the, the national standards moving forward. I have no further questions, Council Member Ryan. 
I have about four or five questions on datum points. <laughs> I, no, my main question is, it looks like if we do this legislation, we won't be back here again. That's correct. This, we will give you authority to... I'm, I'm, and my question to you, Chair, is are we willing to give up repeated <laughs> discussions <laughs> and data? No. Joking aside, I know how important this technical thing is, certainly, and um, I appreciate you bringing this forward, and I think this path seems yeah. great. So. All right, great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I will open the public hearing. I have one person signed up for uh, this public hearing, and that's Mr. Alex Zimmerman, and he is not here, so nobody else here to speak, I will close the public hearing and we'll be back again at our next committee meeting to pass this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thanks for your work. Uh, item number three. Agenda item three is the Seattle Public Utilities Seismic Program. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Mommy. Alex Chen with Seattle Public Utilities. Great. And who would like to kick us off? I will kick things off. All right. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today to talk about our seismic study. Uh, before Alex gets into the details of our methodology and findings, I'd like to just spend a moment to discuss the study in the context mm -hmm. of our broader efforts to ensure resilient water system. Uh, what, what does Seattle Public Utilities mean by resilience? Um, for us, it means... Can you check to make sure your mic's on, the oh, green uh, button? There you go. There you go. Okay. okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. For us, it means the ability to recover from sudden or gradual stressors that impact our ability to serve our customers. So preparing for an earthquake is just one part of SPU's resiliency framework, which we are currently working on at your request, which it turns out has been extremely prescient because it's now uh, uh, most very recently a federal requirement that we have a risk and resiliency framework for our water system plan, um, and that's due in 2020. Uh, that framework, our resiliency framework, will guide the utility in addressing an array of risks su such as climate change, fire, cyber attacks, economic upheaval, earthquakes, and other emergencies. And the drinking water system study, or seismic study that we're talking about today, builds on previous efforts that started in the 1990s. But now we're incorporating more recent information about regional risks, such as the Seattle Fault, which we didn't know about at that time. And over the past three decades, our ratepayers have been investing in seismic upgrades to our system to the tune of about $100 million. Uh, and these uh, improvements include reservoir retrofits and replacing critical or vulnerable water mains with seismic resilient pipe to decrease the risk of breaks. And in our understanding of some of the important uh, challenges that we face are relatively recent. Um, however, the people of Seattle have shown over and over since they saw the need to create a water system after 55 city blocks were wiped out 130 years ago that they have the vision a desire to assure that we can respond to and recover from adversity. So I'm gonna ask Alex to talk about the plan now. Thanks, Mommy. So today I'll cover the seismic study in a relatively high level. Happy to provide more detail or answer questions as needed. We'll go a little bit uh, into the background as well as what the recommendations of the study include. And some basic themes I wanted to cover today underpinning the overall effort here is that this is a continuing effort in a long decades effort. It also fits into the overall resiliency framework Mommy mentioned. It uh, represents one of our ways to be um, continually, uh, continuing to be forward thinking and also to form a seismic projects into the overall capital budget since we have many drivers for capital and operating and to try to balance all of those <laughs> against uh, rate affordability, which we know is a continuing concern as we share. Um, because this is a large effort, it touches more on than just our department. And so we've been very busily working within the city, most notably with the Office of Emergency Management, Seattle Fire Department, and uh, other departments, as well as many outside stakeholders, such as our Department of Health, our regulator, wholesale customers, our 
uh, retail customers, through advisory groups, uh, other interested parties in the desire to balance uh, forward thinking and rate affordability. Um, the um, I'm just wondering whether or not there's a different way of measuring the investment to date um, as demonstrated here versus in the report. I think the report used uh, the executive summary said that $60 million um, had been invested to date. Um, and I also have been hearing that we've been uh, referencing the uh, investment number of $100 million recently. Is there a difference in how we're, we're measuring those investments? It, it mostly reflects continuing <coughs> projects. So by the time the seismic study was about wrapped up, we were in the process of doing other seismic work, most notably seismic resistant water main on first and as well as uh, western. And so that speaks to most of the differential between those two numbers. And um, I know uh, a lot of this work is um, part of other work, right? And so um, it, it can sometimes be hard to point to a discrete project and say, oh, that's a seismic project. But is there a way that you could uh, give us a little bit more detail, finer detail on those, um, those investments, that $100 million investments um, for, for projects that it is a, the seismic work is a discrete uh, piece of the work and um, for those projects where um, if there's a way to sort of lump them into another category, that it's that the seismic investments are part of a larger capital project, that would be really helpful. Definitely. And what I could say is the 60 uh, to $100 million reflect, reflects work that's primarily seismically driven and has mostly a seismic component. Whereas uh, in addition to that, other projects where, for example, we were reinvesting in our drinking water treatment plants in the early 2000s, had a seismic component as a piece of the puzzle. Okay. So they're based on the latest seismic codes. We think they'll perform fairly well in the catastrophic earthquake that we're now designing for, but that wasn't the main driver for the upgrade. That's helpful. So you're not, e that, that, <coughs> those kinds of projects aren't even counted in the, in the $100 million investment. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. So as Mommy mentioned, the importance of uh, water post-earthquake is multifaceted. Primarily, the things we think about are fire pr protection. You know, during the 1989 Loma Prieta quake in the Bay Area, uh, much of the marina district had significant fires and limited water for firefighting. That's relatively recent. Public health, water for drinking, everyday life, and keeping the business of the city running here. In recent earthquakes, this is a table that illustrates five earthquakes over the last 30 or so years. And the basic themes are that the damage from the earthquakes consisted of, generally speaking, significant fires and large-scale water outages, much longer than the three days, three ways that was being planned for decades ago. Um, in some cases, taking gradual periods to recover service, taking 45 plus or 60 days to recover full service with a recovery of some folks early on and as the system recovers, gradual uh, recovery over time. So that leads us to where we have been in the drinking water system. In 1990, we started thinking about seismic planning and conducted an overall study and I'll tell you a little bit more about what's changed since then. But since that study, we went through a series of seismic upgrades, the 60 to $100 million, and we continue to do so. Since 1990, though, new information has arose. Back in 1990, the Pacific Northwest was thought of as a lower hazard zone than, for example, California, which was a little bit more developed in the thinking from an overall statewide uh, regional perspective. Since then, we've seen, for example, two faults that were known um, have discovered to be much more active than thought. And I'll show you on a map where those are. The two are the Seattle Fault Zone, which is a shallow zone of faulting, not a discrete fault like the San Andreas Fault where you can walk over and point to where the motion will be, but a two to three mile long band of potential faulting, much more difficult to predict and plan for. Uh, that's one. The other is the Cascadia subduction zone. That's the earthquake that was popularized in the New York Yorker article in 2015 as the one, the big one that will make half of Seattle fall into the sea. 
We don't think that's going to happen, but we do think it's worth planning for. Um, we've also seen earthquake experience per the table on the previous slide that has shown very significant damage that underpins the kind of findings we're seeing as well. Lastly, we're seeing that over the last 20 to 40 years, in Japan, where they've had much more catastrophic earthquakes much more regularly, they've developed uh, systems for water pipe that are much more earthquake resistant than what was available in the United States. And those systems are coming to the US and we're using them starting relatively recently. So the study is essentially looking at what kind of hazards we might be exposed to, how our facilities will do, if they're shaken to a certain degree for a certain time of period, uh, period of time, and then putting them all together using computer modeling to simulate how the system will perform, how people are actually affected, and then developing mitigation measures of a couple different varieties and looking at what time scale to implement them. Lastly then, when we replace facilities, making sure we have well-defined standards for how to design the most resilient for seismic and other goals. On the uh, two previous slides, uh, you talk about potential for mass availability, earthquake-resistant pipe. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yes. So until recently in the United States, there was no American manufacturer for seismic-resistant pipe. So what that is is pipe with a certain type of material and a certain type of joining method that makes the pipe act more flexibly so that it can deform with ground motion instead of breaking it will move and still stay functional. So the Japanese have been developing this type of pipe, and until recently there was no way, let's say on a project with a Buy American requirement, to uh, get that kind of pipe. So West Coast and other utilities have been actively working over the last 10, 15 years with the local, uh, the American pipe manufacturers to develop systems and to find ways to also include the Japanese pipe manufacturers in bids where the laws and requirements allow. So we've been fortunate to have some progress made to where we can actually implement a few projects and um, feel like we are um, implementing the latest technology for seismic resistance. Is there work that needs to continue to be done so that you can uh, actually uh, have the ability to purchase as much as you need, or is that um, not a problem anymore? At this point, there's just working with the manufacturers to make sure that they all have as wide of a suite of possibilities out there so that the bidding prices can be more competitive. Working with local contractors to learn how to install these types of pipes, it's a learning curve, and we've certainly experienced that in our first two projects. Uh, but otherwise, I think the framework is fairly well set, and we're just trying to build on that. And, and is the plan to, um, to at some point, uh, move to only using these kinds of pipes, or um, is there sort of a, an approach or a best practice that you apply for uh, when you need to use it and when you don't? That's part of the study. And the idea then is when we define these seismic design standards, also where to use them. So the two categories are critical backbones. So making sure we have a backbone of piping that gets to within the whole system for primarily firefighting purposes. And we're working with the fire department on identifying where that backbone lives. And then pipes that go through hazard zones. I'll show you a map liquefaction, uh, areas where the pipes will be subject to big ground movements using that seismic design, where everything else, areas where pipes are not anticipated to move, less critical, not paying the price premium to invest in that seismic uh, standard. There is a upcharge essentially, a significant material price difference and an incremental install cost. Thank you. So one thing just to make clear here is that the design earthquake 30 years ago is different than the design set of earthquakes <laughs> nowadays. And to be more specific, I think all of us remember the 2001 Nisqually quake, then back before that in similar magnitude, uh, 1965, 1949, I think, something like uh, 6.5 to 7.0 magnitude. Um, and those are what we essentially were designing around. 
uh, when you look at the types of earthquakes that we are looking at these days, we have a much greater potential for shaking and ground movement than was thought 30 years ago. And the two varieties are a crustal, very shallow Seattle fault event that goes right through the city all the way across Lake Washington to the east side, about a 7.0 magnitude. And so the magnitude, um, you have to cross-reference it against the origin of where the earthquake starts. Then you have this Cascadia subduction zone, 9.0 magnitude, much larger, but much farther and deeper offshore, so that by the time the waves get to Seattle, um, much less of a shaking, although the duration of shaking could be much longer. So we have to look at both to try to figure out which facilities are more sensitive to what kind of shorter, sharp accelerations, uh, less sharp, but longer period accelerations. Certain facilities are more sensitive either way. What we're finding is that these earthquakes that are the next step above what we used to plan for, there's something in the range of a 15 to 20 percent chance of one of those happening in the next 50 years. When we go down to the Nisqually level earthquake, very likely something like that will happen again in the next 50 years. The water system has performed fairly well in those last several earthquakes, minor damage, minor loss of service, but generally no uh, perception of loss from the public, continued water supply. Um, and so we think those were well suited for that style of earthquake. It's the next level up that we're now starting to think more about based on studies in the last 5, 10, 15 years. So this map shows the type of hazards that we need to plan for. And bisecting the city, the red, uh, pink, and orange shows zone of potential thrust faulting. So that shallow thrust faults, uh, lots of ground displacement moving and shaking um, from the shallow origin. And if you notice how wide that band is, it's not like uh, one line that you can plan for, well, the pipes are all going to break here. It's more of a, how do you think about how to plan for this over this large range, either in selected pipe improvements, whole pipe improvements, risk management, and being able to recover after the pipes break and move. So those are the things we'll talk about in a minute. Layered on top of those, the Seattle uh, fault zone is shown in orange is uh, liquefaction zones, zones where the soils aren't that good and in shaking, they will not have any bearing potential, they'll slump, they'll cause things that are supported on them to fail, that kind of thing. Also shown in, uh, is that pink or purple, uh, steep slopes. Those are the kinds of uh, areas that lead to greatest ground movement and shaking in earthquakes. Um, on, that, on that slide, I note um, that uh, one of the um, criteria or the, one of the conditions that lead to uh, susceptibility for liquefaction, liquefaction is um, known or potential landslides. That's correct. And this is an, um, an issue that I've had um, some interest on uh, as it relates to the funding that SDOT um, allocates to address um, uh, landslide areas that they have identified in advance um, as needing proactive work. And um, a couple years ago, we added some additional funding in the budget. It was a one-time add of about $1.5 million. Currently, um, the SDOT only allocates $500,000 a year uh, to address these um, these known uh, locations. These are specifically locations that are um, near arterials, and they have identified. There's there was a, a list created um, several years ago, over 20 years ago. I think it was uh, yeah, it was about 20 years ago, um, and it identified the top 20 or so locations throughout the city where there needed to be proactive work done to. Uh, minimize the likelihood of uh, landslides. They've basically not been able to do any proactive work at any of these locations, and what they've been using that $500,000 a year for is only to address um, minor slide um, activity that has occurred at those locations and other locations. And so it's been very concerning to me that, um, you know, there was this study, again, done 
about 20 years ago that identified these high risk areas, um, not just high risk, again, for landslides, but high risk for landslides near arterials. Um, so, you know, potential for harm to, um, to property and people. And um, so I just want to flag this. I, I, I see that SPU is working with SDOT on um, addressing um, some of these known or potential land sites. And I want to flag this as something that's a um, really high priority for me to um, really begin to uh, figure out how we make the investments to do this proactive work um, rather than always spending um, the, the funds that we have, the limited funds that we have towards um, addressing the impacts. Thanks. Thank you. We will definitely continue to work with SDOT on any number of projects, including this one. Would, would you, you like to learn more about our work I and would. assessment? Yeah. We have an excellent team who, who, does, who does work in this area. That would be really helpful. Okay. We'll, we'll arrange for a briefing. Maybe uh, yourself and SDOT together. Okay. Thanks. All right. So the vulnerability assessment is, again, when we look at the hazards for earthquakes, how our pieces and parts, the facilities and pipelines perform, put it all together through a computer model, the results are telling us that both for a Seattle fault zone and a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, the results will be somewhat similar. That is not that different from what other West Coast utilities who have experienced this new level of catastrophic earthquake, Japanese, um, Australian, New Zealand, very similar. That is, large transmission pipelines that connect our watersheds and treatment plants to the people in town, um, generally lost until the crews can get out and recover and repair. That the, we're depending then on the storage <laughs> inside the city limits that we have. And that storage is then impacted by all the leaks that occur from the pipes inside the city leaking themselves. So then loss of some of the stored water that could be used for firefighting and for public health loss to leaks throughout the city and associated damage from those leaks. And um, with that, combining all that together, potential loss of water pressure, available pressure for firefighting and for domestic public health within a day or so for this, these catastrophic earthquakes. And, um, who is the owner of the east side supply line? Uh, we are. We are. Okay. So there's, um, this isn't a multi-jurisdictional uh, um, uh, cost-sharing thing. It is because of, we have wholesale customers. Uh, that's correct. So our wholesale customers use about half of the overall water in the Seattle system, and they cost-share in capital and O&M when it comes to the regional type of projects, transmission pipes, water supply, water treatment. So we're very busily talking to them about these recommendations and what to do next, making sure there's opportunities for collaboration, buy-in, um, regional work together. So for a mitigation approach, we're trying to take a long-term approach and focus on two buckets of uh, improvements. One is uh, what can we do in the relative short term to improve that response time, getting people back in water, keeping the city going after a catastrophic earthquake? So we have emergency preparedness and response planning. Uh, most notably here is looking at how much repair material we have in stock and how our staff and supplemental um, uh, others could be used to uh, improve our response time to get pipes fixed, the system back up and running. Uh, also working with OEM and outside city departments, um, outside external agencies on making sure there's a cohesive plan for providing emergency water for people, whether it's through our reservoirs, which I'll get to in a minute, whether it's through distribution of bottled water or other strategies. Uh, when, it when we talk about um, isolation and control, that means that if we think the system will leak significantly, how can we preserve some of the water in that system to be used as needed for firefighting, domestic, other needs? Some of our reservoirs, which represent something like uh, two-thirds of the storage in the system, have seismically actuated outlet valves. So in the event of a large earthquake, those valves would close automatically, they could be opened again as needed to let water out as needed for various purposes. 
So part of the strategy might be what other valving might we want in the system to augment the existing capabilities, seismically actuated valves. And then the last one is when we talk about storage, we'll find out in a minute that our amount of storage is less than what other West Coast utilities have. And one very cost-effective way for us to augment that storage is to keep Roosevelt's and volunteer reservoirs in service for emergencies only, non-potable. And I'll get to the details of what that means in a minute. So then going from more or less short term to large scale capital project kind of work, first of all is when pipes reach the end of their life, when facilities reach the end of their life, make sure they're designed with the seismic standards in mind and make sure those are well communicated. And then look at critical facilities. So when you looked at that map, a couple areas jump out. For example, where our big transmission pipes cross highly seismically hazardous areas like river crossings, liquefaction zones, look at those point sources and look at how to upgrade those. And when you do that, try to look at how to do that most effectively. When you add all the numbers up over 50 years, it's a fairly large amount, 15 to $20 million of capital projects. But that includes significant amounts of point source capital upgrades that are seismically driven. And what we did is tried for those to program the largest number just to bracket how that might look. In realistic uh, approach, what we do is through an asset management approach, for each project, for any given driver, we're trying to look at the most cost effective way to reach that goal, desired goal, to re retain service. So uh, the most costly way to do a river crossing upgrade would be to dig out the existing pipes and put in new ones that are seismically resistant. If you have three, that's you know, three times the cost. Another approach could be if you need less flow, you could upgrade one of three pipes. Another approach would be, like in the picture, some of the California utilities, a little more predictable, have put in flexible connections so that the pipes will break, but they can restore service very cost effectively, although not as immediately as the pipe never breaking in the first place. So we'll look at those options through our typical options analysis process, looking at life cycle costs, balancing risk against um, price, and try to figure out what makes the most sense. In some of the cases, these numbers that add up to the large total might be less if we can find reasonable ways to balance that risk against cost. So um, the 15 to 20 million uh, per year, um, is that an estimate based on uh, full upgrades? Where we have point source upgrades, yes, uh, full upgrades, the more conser most conservative approach that um, we were looking to do. And I do want to emphasize that point because um, the questions come up about how does that affect rates over the long term. And the two points that I wanted to make are that seismic is just one of many drivers, and uh, you all know that very well based on the strategic business plan discussions where we're <coughs> constantly trying to look at the overall rate path as well as strategically our many goals, and this is one of them. Um, the other one is that for these seismic projects, when you look at these point upgrades, um, it's pretty conservative to look at rate impacts assuming the most conservative type of upgrade over 50 years. So what I'd show you here is in our water system plan, which we presented to you uh, two or three months ago, this graph shows the last uh, 20 or 30 years of capital spending in gray and then the next projected 20 years of capital spending in different colors. I'll mention that in the history that the path has been relatively uh, bumpy and that's predicated on regulatory upgrades for the treatment plants and covering our reservoirs and putting parks on top. And we're more into a relatively consistent capital phase where we're looking at programmatic upgrades of water mains, large pipes, and the lumpy pieces would be more um, spread out than they have been in the past, facility projects and so on. What this graph attempts to show is that seismic is a piece of the overall puzzle for the drinking water system, capital budgeting around 80 million a year. 
The green um, is transmission pipes, which are almost entirely seismically driven. The purple shows distribution pipes, which are driven by many different drivers, of which maybe 20 to 25 percent is seismically driven by upsizing the um, approach to certain pipes when you replace them to use seismically resistant systems. So that's the effort to try to um, blend seismic into the overall CIP. And as we continue to do the SBP updates, rate studies, we'll continue to look at seismic as one of all the drivers as the whole package um, that we present to you. And so how does this relate to the strategic business plan that um, the council um, already adopted? It, are, are these numbers um, new? Um, or are they reflected in the strategic business plan? They're reflected in the strategic business plan. As we go through our next three-year update of that six-year period, we will start to see some of those uh, seismic projects be added to that in the, the next three-year piece of the update. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be busily communicating to our customer review panel and then to mayor council about what those impacts mean as part of the overall rate package. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, manage for the, uh, the reality that we'll continue to learn more over time and we're making multi-million dollar investments? I mean, you talked about you know, our knowledge today is very different than it was 30 years ago of these subduction zones. And I'm assuming that 20 years from now, we'll, have a, we'll know a lot more too. And you know, I'm not asking you to predict the future unless you can, that would be great. But, but what is like an engineering approach to these long-term investments to accommodate that so we're not like, oh, oops, that was the wrong thing. We're gonna tear that out and start over again. I will say that of the projects we've done in the past, certain ones were designed to a lower standard than what we know now to be what we want to design around. I think, you know, I, I can't tell the future. And <laughs> what I could say from an engineering standpoint is understanding the experience that other utilities have had, comparing notes with them. And then when we look at how to um, manage seismic risk, trying to err on the side of conservatism, both in terms of capital design, like do we design maybe another increment of flexibility in some of our pipes than what we think is absolutely necessary? Um, dealing with um, operational risk, should we be a little bit more prepared than we think that the design might suggest? Probably makes some good sense. Um, that's essentially the engineering limit of what we can yeah. try to do. That's great. Um, re returning to the question about the um, strategic business plan. So the, um, the graph shows uh, an uptick in spending in 2024. Um, so does that mean that um, in when we do our three-year update that we are going to look at moving some of the projects from 2024 um, into the strategic business plan period? Um, and, I, you know, and how is that going to impact um, our ongoing conversations about affordability? Because what I think I hear you saying is this graph is... Um, accurate for the current strategic business plan, but when we update the strategic business plan in three years, um, there will be some some changes to incorporate what we're planning to do. And since it's a six-year window, I'm I'm just trying to figure out um, how that is going to um, how we should start to visualize that impacting right rates. Uh, well, again, I, I think when we update the strategic, strategic business plan, um, going from currently 2018 to 2023, we will then move that path forward three years through 2026, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so you're right, some of the uptick in the capital projects will be shown in that next three-year window. And our challenge will be then to balance that against other priorities and then figure out where the water piece of it balances against the other funds so that we can present a whole picture to council for review, trying to balance many different priorities. So this will be a piece of it for sure. And that, that's a good catch. Thank you. And, and one thing to keep in mind is that uh, the anticipated costs of the kinds of investments we'll need to make is large, but we'll, could we you know, can be invested in over a long period of time. And so the current uh, schematic financial planning has us looking at another 50 years 
of investments. Uh, and so, you know, this is something that we, as Alex said, we need to look holistically at with the other lines of the other investments that are being made and over time with the mayor's office and council and the customer review panel. And um, one of the things, one of the adjustments that we had made to the strategic business plan was um, some rate smoothing. And so I'm just wondering if these these dips and then upticks are going to um, impact our ability to have um, rates be relatively smooth and not have also reflect these um, ups and downs. What looks like bumpiness here, though, is you know the the, um, the water line of business is you know we looked at it in context of the investments being made in the drainage and wastewater line of business, uh, and so. Uh, you know, you, we, we look at rate smoothing for the overall, you know, three th three funds. Um, so, you know, you're right. We have to, you know, but we have to look at them all three together so that we minimize any bumpiness for our customers. Okay. Thank you. To some degree, too, market, market conditions may make a big difference. Many of the unit costs we looked at incorporate the current market pricing, where oftentimes we have one or two bidders on a construction project and they're not especially motivated to you know be price sensitive where um, if market conditions change we may have uh, lower prices which would affect how this plays into the overall rate package but again i can't predict the future <laughs> uh, last piece here is roosevelt and volunteer so a great deal of community interest we want to be sensitive to that we started the process of potentially decommissioning and um, surplusing these reservoirs uh, many years ago before the current thinking of seismic uh, planning. So under an old set of assumptions, they may not have been as necessary. What we're finding is that um, with these current understandings of hazards, that storage is needed. We are lower than we would like to be, both in terms of a benchmark comparison to other utilities, as well as our own analysis suggests what we need for our own purposes. And then those two reservoirs, um, we can convert them from currently disconnected from the system to emergency storage very cost effectively. Essentially, those reservoirs are non-potable because they don't have covers. Before the latest round of drinking water regulations, those reservoirs without covers were perfectly potable reservoirs. And so um, we fill them with drinking water. We can store drinking water in them. It's the regulation that makes them non-potable, non-drinkable. In an earthquake, um, if we have those reservoirs disconnected from the system, but easily reconnected through a piece of pipe that we're able to connect in a hurry. We have, in this case, uh, 70 million gallons of storage to add to our inventory of about 250 million gallons of storage. It's a significant increment that will help uh, us recover more smoothly, provide firefighting water and domestic water wh when it's needed most. The um, second bullet there says that we have less emergency storage than other uh, <coughs> comparable utilities. Um, does the dedication of uh, Roosevelt and uh, Volunteer address that, or are we still we still down even with those? We are down even with those, and and the numbers depend on how you calculate and um, lots of different assumptions. Generally speaking, we're at about two, two and a half days of storage, assuming that the system doesn't leak out entirely, no leaks. Uh, other utilities under the same assumptions up and down the West Coast are in the four to five day range. Most notably, some of the California utilities in the four to five day range have also already upgraded their transmission systems. So there's much more likelihood that they'll continue to get water from their watersheds to their retail service area. So that's kind of belt and suspenders compared to where we're low on storage and we haven't yet really started to invest in that transmission system for this new level of catastrophic earthquake. So even with addition of Roosevelt and Volunteer, it brings us up to three-ish days. Practically speaking, there's not much real estate in the city to add more storage as much as we would like to, but you know, we, we're, we look <laughs> where we can. And so um, is there a, a, a plan or is it possible to figure out how to get water from our 
um, watersheds in the case of a catastrophic event? It's really the investment in those transmission pipelines, whether it's full-scale replacement at uh, weak points That's the, make, or that makes it possible. making sure it's uh, easily repairable. That's the real critical piece that allows us to rely less on our storage in town. And um, like, has there been sort of an analysis of um, how much those investments bring us to a four to five day storage standard, if that is indeed the standard? Uh, yeah, I'll show you a recovery curve uh, because the single day number is a little misleading because recovery is a gradual process over time. Mm -hmm. And this graphic here, it's overly complicated and a little hard to read here, but um, the x-axis shows days for return to service. The y-axis shows 0% all the way up to 100% of the people who live in Seattle have water at their taps. The gray shows the estimated band of recovery period existing. The blue shows estimated after 20 years of improvements. The uh, green, I guess, shows uh, after 50 years. And the way to read these is if you pick a number, let's say um, uh, 14 days, which is what the number is we're working with OEM to establish for what people should do to be prepared, water, supply, shelter, pets, th these sorts of things. Then if you look at how that cross-references with the gray, on average, about 40% of people will have water at their taps after two weeks, after a major catastrophic earthquake. That would be supplemented with provision of emergency drinking water at our reservoirs, bottled water um, as part of our emergency response plan. After 50 years, you go up to the green, and instead of 45%, it becomes 85%. So that's the way we're trying to think about um, the types of improvements that people can see the value in what we're doing, the estimated um, quicker recovery um, to regular life after a really big earthquake. That's really helpful. Thank you. I, I have a summary here, but I, I think I've covered a lot of the topics here. And at, at this point, um, would just welcome any questions. That's Member Bryan. Do you... Um, do we have a similar plan um, planned for the drainage and wastewater system? We don't yet. We've learned a lot from this study that we intend to bring into studying our drainage and wastewater system. We have, um, uh, through the kindness of the Japanese consulate here in Seattle, um, been able to develop uh, good relationships with scientists and city administrators in different cities in Japan who have been able and are continuing to advise us on the risks and approaches for mitigating risk uh, that that they have experienced um, in, in, in their respective cities. And um, there's a lot of good knowledge. So as part of our integrated plan for drainage and wastewater that we're um, already you know, starting on, um, we will be uh, including seismic assessments so that we have a good foundation for, for coming up with a, you know, a, 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 a integrated plan that accommodates the full range of risks that we have to think about. So, so no plan yet, but a plan to plan? We have a plan to plan. Um, and then uh, one last question I had is the Seattle Times story uh, referenced the issue of um, uh, not having uh, SPU staff who could fix the, the pipes um, in the case of a catastrophic event because of their size. Do you recall that? And, and is that how, how do we deal with that? Well, actually, we have maintenance staff who are very good at fixing both our large diameter transmission pipes and our small diameter um, pipes within the city limits. One of the focus areas for the Times was where do those folks live and do they have access to repair materials, trucks, um, that sort of thing in a pinch. And what we find out is that fewer and fewer of our maintenance workers live within the city limits. And that's um, got its pros and cons. The pro is that as they live further away from the city limits, they're, more, um, clo they're closer to the large diameter transmission pipelines, and many of them have that expertise, and all of our field materials are located in outside of the city limits. 
The downside, of course, is for the leaks inside city, it will take folks coming into the city through road networks that may be compromised, um, additional time to get uh, the, those pieces of the system repaired. So that's as part of the resiliency framework, looking at workforce planning, how to deal with these sorts of issues from a overall utility perspective. So it's not the um, the lack of knowledge or experience, just the lack of being accessing Seattle if they live outside of the city. For sure, uh, we know how to work on these, but then there's also the question of if you have many more leaks or breaks than we're currently staffed up for, how do you get to all of those? Either prioritize, use contractors, work with other agencies, mutual aid, mm -hmm. and that's part of what we're trying to navigate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I don't have anything further. This is an ongoing body of work, and we'll continue to, to talk about it. And I um, appreciate you guys taking the time and um, bringing us up to speed. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen. All right. Sobering stuff. <laughs>